We will now turn to the Spanish overseas empire and its efforts to explore. So recall that the Reconquista was the reconquest of Spain by uh, Christian kingdoms, wresting it from the control of Islamic civilization, was understood as something like a crusade. And so when the Spanish monarchs con completed it in 1492, they wanted to launch a new crusade to the Holy Land. The, basically, the idea was, well, we, you know, we've successfully uh, reconquered Spain for Christianity. Let's go on to the Holy Land, right? That kind of makes sense, logically speaking, from their perspective. This crusade is successful. Let's move on to the next. But that takes money, right? We, we tried to talk about that before, that you can't have an army or anything like that without having the money to back it. And I love the Chinese saying, rich country, strong army. I mean, you need an economic basis for your country, for your army to work. So exploration is something that can help with that, right? I mean, if we go out and explore and we find new trade routes, then we could make money, right? We've talked about how Europeans want to get access to that Indian Ocean trade. They can make money from that. So we go out and explore, we get access to that, we'll get money, we can launch our crusade. And Christopher Columbus, and he does this as soon as the Reconquista is like over, right? Like it's amazing. Like I believe that there's a parade like celebrating the end of it. And Columbus actually approaches the monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella there, right? That's King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And uh, he presents his plan. He wants to sail west to get east, right? Now, sometimes people have said that, well, you know, these people were ignorant they thought the earth was flat and that if you sailed across it, you'd fall off. And um, Columbus was sailing around to prove that the earth was round. And most educated people did not believe that. I don't know what, uh, what peasants may have thought. But educated people understood that the earth was round. And you can see this. Even the Middle Ages, they understood this. They didn't think the earth was flat. And you can see this in the fact that the symbol of power was often an orb marked with the cross to show Christianity being triumphant over the world. That was the idea. But they certainly understood this. So Columbus knew the world was round. And so he said, you know, if we want to get east to those spices, let's just sail west. And he's logically correct. He just didn't know how big the world was. And it's fortunate for him that the Americas were there because he would have died in the middle of the ocean if there had been no continent there. Right. It was known that the world was round. It just wasn't clear how big it was. Now. Christopher Columbus, I mean, the voyages he wants to put together, it's not cheap, right? He's got the three ships and the men to, to man them and the cargo and the, the uh, supplies and the cannon and all that. It's not cheap, but Ferdinand and Isabella, they're king and queen of Spain. They've got that nice tax administration. They've got access to plenty of money. Yeah, they'll throw the guy some money. Why not? Maybe it won't work, but we've got the money. And if it pays off, it'll pay off big. And wow, did it ever pay off big for the Spanish crown. So they're going to take a gamble and support him. And I just want to stress again, usually I'm not too strict about years in this class, but 1492, the same year that Reconquista ends, is the same year that Columbus goes out and explores. And so we, we can't really do counterfactual history, but it's always curious, what would have happened if Islamic civilization would have held on to Spain? Would Islamic civilization eventually gone to explore? And what would that what kind of world would that have meant if it was Muslim explorers who made it to the Americas first? Been kind of different it would be a different world, certainly. But it's going to be the Spanish who do that. I should point out Christopher Columbus was himself Italian. Um, no one was willing to fund him there, but he got the money from the Spanish. So in 1492, we have the European discovery of America. I mean, of course, the people in the Americas understood where they were or, you know, understood, yeah, we exist, we're here. Um, that's why I call it the European discovery, meaning the discovery for Europeans. But Christopher Columbus just is going to run smack into this continent um, in his effort to get to the Indies, to get to the Indian Ocean trade. He's going to find this continent that's new to Europeans. And I like this image here because, again, it shows us this idea of why Europeans are traveling, uh, where they're, you know, why they're exploring. And you see that their desire for gold and religion. And you can also see the importance of those powerful ships and weapons, right? Notice that he has with him two arquebusers, two guys armed with primitive muskets. 
There's this idea we have to come with power. Now, Christopher Columbus will not actually hit mainland North and South America. He mostly just runs around in the Caribbean islands. The first landing is in San Salvador. And I think it's interesting that, again, you can see the religious nature of this because uh, San Salvador would translate as Holy Savior, meaning Jesus. Uh, in other words, thank God we survived the voyage, but they made it. Now, unlike the Portuguese empire, the Spanish empire is going to focus on the conquest of territory. Right, the Spanish Empire is going to focus on the con on the conquest of territory, so you can see um, that the Spanish they're going to seize this territory here and all around here. The Portuguese will get this area, but the this is where the Spanish are going to be active, and we're going to focus mostly on them. Now we talked earlier about the Aztec Empire, which was an amazing, powerful empire. Uh, it was a warrior culture. So they knew a little something about fighting, and they were so good at fighting, right? They had subjected, uh, subjugated rather, uh, this a huge amount of area and made it a part of the Aztec Empire. So I want to stress, it's really amazing in a sense that the Spanish were able to come in and conquer all this territory because you had these really amazing advanced civilizations there, right? And the Spanish will run into the uh, Incas and the Aztecs. And what's really shocking is if you look at the Aztec Empire, it had about 25 million people in it. Spain had only 8 million. And the Spanish are going to cross the ocean and conquer this empire made up of millions of people. And it's astounding, but we're going to have to try and explain it, which we will momentarily. So the Spanish are going to conquer much of the Americas. Uh, and I like to talk a little bit about, especially about the Aztec conquest, though we do mention the Incas. And the man who carries that out is, is named Hernan Cortez. And Cortez is a, is a fascinating character. He was really unscrupulous. Um, like, he wasn't really, he didn't really have permission from the government, uh, the Spanish government, to go out and attack the Aztecs. Uh, he didn't really have permission just to go visit them. Um, he was trying to get permission. He, I think it was granted him for a brief time, but then they changed their mind, and then he just left. <laughs> and then when they sent people to arrest him, he actually marched his army away from the Aztecs, fought the Spanish there, convinced um, the people that were trying to arrest him that really they should just join him and go march on the Aztecs, and they did. So, uh, And he probably murdered a few Spaniards as well, too. So this guy, not, not to speak about what he does to the Aztecs, so this is a person who, in many ways, is very unscrupulous, is trying to make money. Um, and he basically just goes, decides to leave Cuba, uh, where there was like a Spanish base, and just go see, go to the Aztecs and see what he can do. Hopefully he can figure out something to make some money, and he ends up conquering them. And you can see the kind of cultural clash that's going to exist. Um, eventually, you, you recall we talked about this temple, right? Um, this temple complex dedicated to the war god and the rain god. And Cortez is going to meet with the Aztecs, and the Aztec emperor Montezuma II isn't quite sure what to do with him, right? Um, some of his advisors are just like, just kill this guy. Let's just be done with him. We don't, these foreigners are going to be do us no good. But Montezuma II was curious, I think. He wanted to learn more about them. And unfortunately for him, that proved his, uh, his, his uh, demise. But to explain to you kind of what happens here, why we had the, the, this cultural clash, Montezuma II takes Cortez. Um, Cortez has come to the city of Tenochtitlan to visit and to have diplomatic talks. And Montezuma II takes Cortez up to the war god's temple and shows him this temple and is very proud of it. Right? We talked about it. it's a marvel of architecture. But the inside of it was covered with the blood of sacrificed victims. And their remains could be seen and smelled. And so Montezuma II is really horrified, or I'm sorry, Montezuma II is really proud of the temple. It's like, isn't our civilization awesome? It's really great. See, this is where we feed the gods, which keeps the world from ending. And isn't that good? You know, aren't you guys impressed? And Cortez, and this I think is fascinating because this shows, even if you're relatively unscrupulous, you can still have a kind of sense of right and wrong uh, from your civilization, you have your values, even if you ignore them. Um, he's horrified, right? This guy, like I said, who has dissipated his government, murdered some people. He looks at the temple and says, 
Montezuma, um, my friend, you are worshiping demons. Uh, this is bad. You know, let us clean this place up. We'll put up a nice picture of the Virgin Mary, a nice crucifix. How would that be? And Montezuma II, of course, is deeply offended by this suggestion. So we have this very serious culture clash. And you can see it so deeply that even someone as unscrupulous as Cortez felt it, right? You know, the, from the Aztec perspective, their religion is about repaying the gods for the benefits the gods gave us. If we don't repay the gods, we're going to be in trouble. From Cortez's perspective, this is the work of the devil, right? Human sacrifice. He's really disturbed by this. So we have a clash of civilizations. And from the perspective of Cortez, this justifies conquest. I'm not saying it does. I'm not making a judgment call here. I'm just trying to explain why the Spanish, like Cortez, as unscrupulous as he could be, still felt okay with doing this. Right? They had this kind of conquistador mentality. They had conquered Spain, um, retaking it back from Islamic civilization. They just saw this conquest as kind of continuing. And just as they saw a religious conflict between them and Islamic civilization, they see the same thing here uh, with the Aztecs. And from their perspective, it's like, okay, we can continue fighting this. And of course, the Aztecs and the Incas will fight back hard. Now, he will end up being able to defeat the Aztecs, which, as I said, is astounding, right? Spain has 8 million people. The Aztecs have an empire of 25 million people. And, you know, it's not like all the Spanish people showed up. I mean, Cortez only had a few hundred Spaniards at best with him. So this is really astounding. Even more astounding is that Francisco Pizarro, another conquistador, will do the same with the Incas. So we've got this very curious situation here, right? I want to stress, you know, the Aztecs and the Incas, they're advanced civilizations, they're warrior cultures, there's lots of them, they've got big empires. Why is it that the Spanish can just come in and defeat them and very small numbers of Spanish. What makes this all possible? How is this done? 